professor here at the University of Southern Denmark, a research fellow at the University of Trento, Italy, yada, 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 yada. <laughs> What's interesting about Kim, uh, Kim, Ken, is Ken. <laughs> Uh, this lovely picture from Edward uh, Riddle's very nice collection of YouTube videos of his interviews, where is Edward, uh, of uh, people in EM, shows Ken, uh, Ken holding forth in a yoga position, which is, I think is kind of interesting and a good picture of Ken. Another good thing, uh, uh, interesting thing about Ken, is if you look on his homepage at the University of Oregon, he's listed this following list of selected publications. And I think selected publications are very interesting because this is what people themselves want other people to orient to concerning themselves. So it's not just a list. And we look at Busted. Ken. Busted. <laughs> yeah. Ken's list is very interesting. It invites an ethnomethodological reading of some sorts. What is the order here? It's not chronological. We have 2013, <coughs> by 2009, and so forth. Uh, and I quite, can't quite sort it out. But if we look at the variety of things that Ken has written, we get a sense of what Ken is about, at least academically. Uh, the re most recent book, More Studies in Ethnic Methodology, of course, is top. We also find, uh, actually, the most recent thing is his translation of the Panchi Lama's debate between wisdom and the reifying habit, or, uh, the, I guess the title of the actual... Uh, I want you to say it in yeah. Tibetan. I, I tried. I, I, I couldn't really like, no, I couldn't really manage it, right? I should look at one of your other books, which is on Tibetan pronunciation. No, no, but the blazing wheel of thunderbolts that stood asunder the Rocky Mountains of egoistic <coughs> reflection. That is very kinnish, I think. Uh, as well as Yoga for Surfers, uh, the second on the list. The third on the, the list... Best <laughs> and the best thing, like, yeah. <laughs> The third on the list is the weighty, 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 the very heavy tone uh, herself's critique of reason with ethnomethodological specifications. Uh, and then uh, a book uh, from uh, 2004 on the Tibetan work and dialectical practice in Tibetan philosophical culture and ethnomethodological inquiry to formal reasoning, and so on. So look at this list and ponder why is it in the order it's in uh, and why these, some things are selected and not others. Right? And you get a good sense, I think, of who Ken Lieberman is. Another way of, of getting a sense of who Ken is, I think, is one of my favorite quotes from Ken's work. Purcell, Schutz, and Gerwitz fully recognized that sense was a complicated matter. But when taken radically, the intersubjective aspects of meaning development added yet a new dimension of complexity since meaning was discovered to be directed to always pending collaborations with other parties, such that one may not know what one means oneself until one discovers what one's words and actions become in the intersubjective collaborations. In some of their studies, ethnomethodologists have, led, ha have had to confront the problem of how to clarify phenomenologically that which was never clear in the first place. And on that note, I give you Ken Lieberman's plenary uh, on studying objectiv objectivation practices in the auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
It's a full hour, uh, and it's a dense hour. I'll try not to talk fast, because I know there's people from 20 countries. Um, but uh, um, and I want to hear the questions. Uh, I guess this, the sad news is due to the late start, we might, uh, we, we might miss some of the coffee talk. Uh, but not a lot of it, because we need the coffee too. In a letter of nomination I wrote on behalf of an award for George Sappas, I stressed the importance of perpetuating the way that Georg Simmel did sociology. And I suggested that Simmel deserved a place alongside Durkheim, Weber, and Marx. Simmel's influence was mostly derived from his influence upon the Chicago School of Sociology, whose founder had studied in Berlin alongside Simmel. And he used to send his graduate students there to, to study with him. In his essay, The Problem of Sociology, Simmel wrote, there is no perfectly clear technique for applying the fundamental sociological concept itself, that is, the concept of association. Since Simmel's time, sociologists have developed perfectly clear techniques. But the fundamental sociological concept has gone missing. However, as Garfinkel said in Seeing Sociologically, a rough statement doesn't tell us what we found, it only tells us what to look for. So what is this thing, association? <coughs> it is for certain that we do not want to define it and then proceed from that definition. Simmel only named it. He did not yet know what it was. Let's look at what he said about it, and this will be the longest quote I'll put up today. <laughs> okay. In addition to the phenomena, which are widely visible and very imposing in their magnitude and external importance, there are an immeasurable number of minor forms of relations and kinds of interaction among humans. Although each of these, taken separately, may appear trivial, it is one of a mass that can scarcely be estimated. By inserting themselves between the comprehensive, official, so to speak, social formations, it is really these minor forms that bring about society as we know it. What renders the scientific determination of such obscure social forms difficult is the very thing that makes them eminently important for the deeper understanding of society. The fact that, as a rule, they are not yet fixated as rigid, super-individual structures, but exhibit society as it were, statu nascendi. They do so not in the sense that they are the very first beginnings, these are historically traceable, but in the sense that they originate each day and each hour. I accept these obscure social forms that originate each day and each hour to be ethnomethodology's data. Let us remember that Edmund Husserl and Gerrit Sibyl were friends and read each other's works carefully. This is a slide of the books in Husserl's library at the Husserl archives in Belgium. Uh, and these are his books by Simmel, and they have extensive marginal notes. It, they reveal that he read Simmel very closely, and of course they corresponded for many years. So in fairness, we can say that some sociological interests that we inherited influenced phenomenology. It's not only that phenomenology influenced us. But Simmel is right that it is not so easy to capture the details of these everyday formations. In a marvelous book, which I highly commend to you by Lorraine Daston and Peter Gallison, uh, called Objectivity, they start out by describing this, uh, this 19th century physical scientist uh, who in the 1870s or thereabouts was trying to draw as accurately as he could how different drops of liquid splatter when they hit the ground. He did water, milk, mercury, all these different liquids. And he tried to be as careful as he could in drawing them. Around the 1880s, photography became ubiquitous and became adopted by natural scientists. And this uh, physical scientist became very excited. Oh, finally, he's going to get it perfect. Right? 
So he went and enthusiastically took these photos, and Daston and Gallison include the photos that he took in his book. And they report that he was very disappointed. Right? The, uh, it turns out his drawings were, were more perfect <laughs> than the real thing. And I think our colleagues who are used to versions of society that resemble that become very upset with us when we keep delivering them stuff like this. <laughs> I want to start today by taking up an aphorism frequently invoked by Garfinkel that events are self-organizing. And I want to explore what this can mean. It is, in effect, a criticism of cognitivism in social science. Intersubjective affairs are unpredictable and events largely run themselves. The reciprocal stimulation, that's also Simmel's term, is so dynamic that the participants frequently just gaze upon the affairs in wonder, barely able to anticipate where things might go next. Things are continuously in flux, and there are no timeouts. The flux of ordinary affairs keeps confounding us by exceeding our efforts to render those affairs orderly, and new rules are born every minute. Simmel wrote, at each moment, such threads are spun, dropped, taken up again, displaced by others, interwoven by others. These interactions among the atoms of society are accessible only to psychological microscopy, as it were. I'm interested in how people cope with the endless entanglements of these recurring dislocations. In ethnomethodology, these go by the following names. First time through, no time out, autochthonous, in vivo, and my favorite, the endless ongoing contingent accomplishments. In the 1970s, Ernest Gellner and others dismissed ethnomethodology as a form of Californian subjectivism. This upset Garfinkel, first because he never thought of himself as a Californian. <laughs> and in fact, he always hated the place. He hated sunshine especially. Right? <laughs> and second, because he was not a bit interested in subjectivity. In his dissertation, he had already spoken against, quote, the sterilities of subjectivity. Instead, he called for ethnomethodologists to pay attention to the neglected objectivity of social facts, which is my topic today. What is this neglected objectivity of social facts? Garfinkel was interested in investigating the ongoing aspect of reciprocal stimulations by elucidating what is developingly objective. And he says that worksite practices are developingly objective and developingly accountable. In our efforts to tame our data, we must not lose the sight of this developingly. And we have yet to fully appreciate the flux of natural affairs, or what Sickle used to call the always emerging character of ordinary events. Members are interested in orderliness and in turning the flux of affairs into something predictable. But in most cases, they're unsure how to do that, and they end up stumbling into any ready-at-hand solution that presents itself in the course of their affairs. Moreover, people do not seek a total organization. They're not sociologists, after all. They're people. Sometimes their interest in organization extends only as far as being able to cross the street. As Garfinkel has taught us, members pick up a method for organizing local affairs and then display how others can use such a method, a rule, a place in line, a recommendation, to accomplish the ordinance. The other methods are instructable matters. The people teach them to each other. But the point I want to emphasize today is that in most cases, these methods are stumbled upon, spotted in the swiftly passing spectacle of the world. Only rarely are they planned with foresight. Or if they are planned, such plans never quite work out in the way that is anticipated. So people are forced to pay close attention to their mundane affairs. And it was this close attention that people pay that most captured Garfinkel's imagination. Even though these methods that people stumble upon and teach each other organize the orderliness of their local affairs, people still become entangled in the circumstantiality of these methods. As Mike Lynch has said, intersubjective order is achieved relentlessly at the surface of communicative actions. 
Members get entangled in the surfaces of the emerging ethnomethods, and those ethnomethods lead the participants rather than the people having and retaining full control of those ethnomethods. Every line of communication becomes an entanglement. For a moment, let's pursue what is meant by entanglement. In the case of coffee tasters, the taste evaluation schedules, these forms they fill out, place something tangible in the professional tasters' hands that they can use to make their activities orderly. But these rating cards end up governing the interaction, even leading the tasters around by the nose. Let's look at how this can work. In Trento, my colleague Joe Ophel and I were attempting to study the indexical properties of taste descriptors. Especially, we were hoping to track the semantic drift of some taste descriptors over the course of tasting several different coffees. And also how those descriptors help parties to develop their understanding of what the taste the coffees had. Jolo especially is very interested in tasting schedules that professional tasters use. And we decided that it would be good to give the tasters a schedule to work with. Here's Jolo passing out the schedule. He's passing out the schedule. They're looking at it for the first time. They know they're supposed to taste coffee. They didn't quite know about the schedule. So, so, so they, they proceed through three rounds of tasting, one for each cup of coffee they taste. It was not predictable, but once this group got their hands on the schedule, they began to use the schedule for managing and coordinating their interaction. For them, the schedule was made to serve two purposes. One, to help them describe the taste of the coffee, and two, to help them coordinate their work together. That is, to give them a way to get on the same page. In the first round, Proposita's body. Uh, balance. So they, they very quickly move from discussion of what the coffee tastes like to using the numbers to respond to what they're tasting. And they find some protection in the numbers. They're less vulnerable. And so they learn how to put the numbers on the page as a way to proceed through this task of going through three coffees. Here's their second cup. Look, look, uh, they're talking about, I think, sweetness. It's a five. Uh, and look at how the woman on the right is staring at the schedule to wonder, what on earth is five? You know, what can five possibly be? It's still really not settled in their mind, just what is five? Uh, they agree to five. They, they coordinate this objective agreement, five. Uh, but what it means, she's very curious about. In this instance, the work of filling out the schedule and the marvelous way it allowed them to concert their talk and get on the same page, both literally and figuratively, led the activity of numerating with the schedule to eclipse the work of describing the taste of the coffee. I don't so much talk about coffee after what he said. <laughs> they do relate the numerating. Actually, I filmed the folks that, that, that make this coffee up in uh, our house. Um, uh, they do relate the numerating to the taste from time to time, but it seems that frequently they substitute agreement about numbers for settling the meaning of the descriptive categories that they're enumerating. At least I would say that they didn't communicate about the meaning to the extent that would allow Joel and I to study the phenomenon of semantic drift that we were intending to do the study for. In their third cup of coffee, here's, the, uh, here's a bit of the transcript, very interesting. Um, they're dealing with sweetness, so chesa, and uh, and the first the, the, they after they've done two cups, it's easier to do a third, right? Because then you have something to compare it with called triangulation in the tasting field. The first was five, and the second the second was a nine, and then she says, okay, a seven. 
<laughs> and and look, look look at how she does that. I mean, there's a certain arbitrariness, right? They're, they're talking numbers. And of course, the, the numbers get away with being objective without having any content, right? And uh, in, a, in another talk, I talk about Adorno's assessments of that, which are very interesting. So, the ethno method that they have developed is driving the analysis. They haven't learned so very much about the coffee, a little bit. Uh, but uh, they are coordinating their work and getting their work done in an efficient way. And in fact, although they never even expected to use a schedule, in their hands it evolves into a full-fledged ethno-method that in fact steals the show. So by the, by the, they become competent with it and become caught up and entangled in those very local methods that they use to provide the orderliness for their affairs. Entangled even as those methods are providing them with the way to the coffee's taste. They are tangled in circumstantiality. Now let's pause for a bit of historical perspective. Garfinkel studied under Parsons, who used his sociological practice in his sociological practice, what had become sociology's standard trope of the homunculus. People were turned into puppets, and the thoughts they had were those that the sociologists could stuff into their heads. For three generations now, it has been clear that the direction of interaction with sociology has been away from this individualism and rationalism. In contrast to Talcott Parsons, Schutz was insistent upon not being satisfied with theorizing society and giving priority to the lived realities of everyday life. In contrast to Schutz, Garfinkel came to mostly avoid even phenomenological theorizing and turned strictly to the studies of naturally occurring activities for his direction, even to the point of being accused of being an empiricist. In place of production practices, Garfinkel began to speak of scenes as self-organized, which are situations where members may be skillful, but they're not in charge. The situation is in charge. Finding one's path through these complexities requires tremendous ability on the part of the members. And as the methodologist examined every one of their artful practices, like a bird watcher who's keenly observant and eager to identify and describe every behavior. But despite those artful practices, members proceed very myopically. Their vision is local, even more local than local. After Husserl, <coughs> I'm calling what they, their vision imminent. To the extent that much of the time, no one is in control. They're caught up in the tendentious imminence of their affairs. I want to investigate how events organize themselves and under what conditions and to what extent members weigh in. And especially, I want to learn whether anybody knows what they're doing. Parsons presumed too much. Schutz presumed too much. And on a few occasions, even Garfinkel and ourselves presumed too much. It's very difficult for us to shed our rationalist blinders. In a 1965 unpublished paper outlining studies in ethnomethodology, delivered at the University of Oregon, Garfinkel said, persons in the ways in which they are members of ordinary arrangements are engaged in the artful accomplishment of the rational properties of indexical particulars. At that early stage of ethnomethodology, I think perhaps we idealized how rational that rational activity was. It turns out that it is not as rational as we were thinking at the time. The notion members already undoes some of the individualist, deliberate, controlling aspects of rational activity, in that it is an admission that people are acting as a collective. Deliberate, voluntarist, rational planning is not unknown, to be sure, but events mostly move too fast for planning to always be effective. Once Garfinkel became absorbed in studying scenic practices in studies, he came to rely less upon social phenomenological idealizations of decision-making and sense assembly and emphasize the autochthonous and tendentious nature of those affairs. Of course, autochthonous comes from the phenomenologist Aaron Gerbich, that word at least. In the last year of his life, when he once casually used the phrase production practices in a conversation with me at his home, I criticized the term production by suggesting that it was too voluntarist. 
I said to him, and he was blind at this stage, but he always listened very carefully, that yes, an orderliness gets produced, but much of the time no one is in charge. And the orderliness that ends up governing affairs can be one that no one had in mind in advance. So produced is not an apt term to describe what is going on. Garfinkel replied with some enthusiasm, yes, yes, you're right. Perhaps we need to give up the term production. Even at that, even at an early stage, Garfinkel intuited something like this. He wrote in Seeing Sociological, one of his early manuscripts, one runs the risk of assuming a rational actor, and we wish to avoid this assumption. And in the same study, he downplays the role of what he calls purposeful calculation in our affairs. So then he asked me what to, term I would use, right? I, I replied as best I could that there is congregational work oriented to finding an orderliness. But we have yet to describe it adequately. So let's look at this congregational work. Aaron Gervich spoke of this congregational work as intersubjectively concatenated and interlocking experiences, which has enough syllables to satisfy any sociologist. <laughs> but once again, this too is only a name and not a specification. I think the most amazing discovery that I've made in the last several years is that these interconcatenations can occur before their meaning is settled. Does the meaning come first, individual consciousness by individual consciousness in the just so Rousseauian, uh, uh, Robinson Crusoean uh, model of, of, of shared understanding? No, not usually. By the way, the meaning may never get settled. And in fact, in many instances, it doesn't have to. Can the objective structures of interaction get worked out before those structures? receive their contents? Yes. Merleau-Ponty offers us a clue. Sense is revealed. I, I, I should add, like Garfinkel, I would say, when in doubt, go look at Merleau-Ponty. Sense is revealed where my own and other people's paths intersect and engage each other like years. Since intersubjectivity is more objective than it is subjective, I'm looking for another name. The point here is that the events are leading the way. And unfortunately, interobjectivity has already been taken. <laughs> Parties must constantly be adjusting to the ongoing, always emerging structures with no timeouts. As a social event leads itself, things are continuously in flux. The artful practices that Garfinkel made so much of are not highly planned doings but rather involve members' keen but opportunistic watchfulness for any object that can be made to work for structuring the local affairs, or more simply, in ways that will keep them out of trouble. More than principles, people's sight extends mostly to what is next, and not much further than that. Their sight is myopic. Things tend toward a direction, but the direction is not always clear or distinct. This is its tendentiousness. In the Boston seminars, and uh, um, there's a wonderful transcript that a colleague of mine made that's been made available at the uh, EMCA Legacy site put together by Southern Denmark University. There's a little bit uh, business card that's available. It has the, uh, the, the URL number. And go on that site, and you can read through the transcript, and everywhere you click, get Garfinkel's voice on these fabulous seminars that George Sass arranged. It's really a wonderful re resource. <clears throat> Garfinkel spoke of the phenomenon as the interior course of its own production. An event drives itself with its own momentum, but even the event doesn't know where it's heading. It's not that the people are not involved, but society moves according to its own vectors. This has to do with the inside width that Garfinkel speaks of in the Methodologies program. People can only work with the practical objectivities that emerge from each occasion. The key thing is that one thing leads to the next, and all memories are short. Doug Macbeth, from whom I learned to appreciate this notion of tendentiousness, informs me that this nextness and the horizon of this nextness identify 
the tendentiousness of affairs. Put in another way, people pattern after each other, picking up ways of formulating and even ways of knowing that follow from the previous speaker. But they frequently misread the previous speaker and inadvertently carry affairs off into novel and unanticipated directions. People must pay attention to these new hinterlands because they keep arriving on the scene without relief. Doug also directed my attention to a fascinating essay by Michael Mormon and Harvey Sachs called On Understanding, which I had read long ago and even used in the class, but had forgotten, where they are emphatic that, quote, turn-taking systems work one other at a time. The imminence of affairs always press upon one, and what is most proximal is what grabs our attention. We are oriented to a next, but there is only one next at a time. This limits the opportunities for longer term organizing. And solutions become restricted to what is close at hand, to what is imminent, without the bigger aims of social science playing a principal role. Ordinary matters can be up in the air with no one certain, and so everyone keeps oriented to that next. Everyone keeps oriented to what next is impending, and people become myopic in their preoccupation preoccupation with that next next that must be handled, to the point that larger scale interests are lost sight of, even forgotten. While, micro while macro sociologists are looking for the big picture, as Simmel describes, and the phenomenologists are looking for the big theories, the parties themselves are preoccupied with not much more than looking for that next next since that is what they need to know in order to survive the interaction. The tendentiousness is the imminent traction that people get on matters that are communicable, the way that people come upon for finding themselves on the same page. Garfinkel always insisted that accounts were vague and that they were subject to indefinite elaboration, that's the et cetera principle. Here we must remember Garfinkel's often repeated warning, there's nothing inside of our heads but brains. What matters is always there in front of us in the spectacle we're sharing. That is why thinking is mostly a public activity. I think tendentious, which I believe is a term Garfield did not use until the 1980s, is a way to repair being too cognitivist in our studies and to remain oriented to the spectacle of the world. It is an admission that things run along to where they are heading on their own and we mostly discover them. Okay, to the title of the talk, Objectivation. I use a model of what I'm calling objectivation after Husserl who first used the term, Schutz used it, and Garfinkel picked it up from then. The objects that people use to organize the local orderliness can be notions or actual physical objects or both. Whichever the case, these objects have a materiality that permits people to sit there, that, that, that sits there in the spectacle and permits people to use it as a focal point for the collaborative attention of the people there. They're used for getting everyone on the same page. They are the tools at hand that the parties can work with. Most importantly, people don't construct or produce these objects. Rather, the objects find their own way to center stage on their own. And even when people do plan for them, they're surprised by what the objects end up becoming. So here's the model I've developed. It's not a very big model. We all know about accounts. People provide accounts to make sense of affairs. Accounts can get confirmed or disconfirmed. The accounts that are confirmed become an adopted uh, uh, version of affairs. But I'm especially interested today in this third stage, objectivation. There's a point at which the accounts that get confirmed need to be elevated in importance so that they stand almost apart from the people's production. By the time you get to the fourth stage, social amnesia, which I won't talk much about today, they're a Durkheimian social fact. They're already, people have forgotten that they produce them. And that happens plenty enough. But in objectivation, people you know, know that they're making of what they've made into some kind of proto-Durkheimian phenomenon that, that is more important than 
any individual member. And so I want to look at what that work is. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it's part of the production. By the time you get to, to the fourth stage, you have the, the immortal social fact. So I'm going to offer several illustrations, uh, three of them. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I, I know you understood all that. <laughs> um, th this first is from my Tibetan data, which, during which the debaters keep getting entangled in the formal analytic structures that they're using to communicate, and they get tangled up in the same way that lawyers get tangled up in legal reasoning and lose track of what ethics are in favor of the technicalities of complying with the law. In this case, we're interested in what they're doing to agree and to objectivate. So the, the person standing up T is basically saying that they're, they're trying to explain the difference between appearance and reality. Just because something appears doesn't mean it's true. So they're saying that even ordinary people understand that a reflection of a face in the mirror is, is not necessarily reality. That, that, it, that there's some gap there. And he gets a confirmation. So there's an account and a confirmation. But then the Tibetans like to do this strange thing. After they get a confirmation, they give you the negative version of the same proposition and then get a rejection. Okay? Uh, and that's done for, for, for several reasons. Um, but he gives, it's not the case that the reflection of the mirror is used that way, and they say no. Okay. And then after they get the rejection, they then go back and give the positive version again. And so he says, so the lack of accord between the appearance of the reflection and the face in the mirror is being positive. So, so that, that, that is uh, understood positive as erroneous. And then he gets the affirmation a second time. So you get two confirmations. Now, the, 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 the Tibetologists say, well, this shows that the Tibetans aren't very good philosophers. They're, they're, they're doing a lot of, of, of uh, simplistic stuff. Well, it's not right. First of all, they're providing a structure that's clear to all the debaters. It's not like one of our conferences where we can say, well, you didn't understand me. You know, that, was, uh, that wasn't what I really meant. Well, it's very clear after you've repeated it three times you know, that, that that's where you stand. And everybody in the room knows that. The, so they're objectivating it. They're making it something that's an object that existed apart from anybody's ability to tweak it. And even more than that, they're using, developing a rhythm. They're using that neg negative form and then the repeated positive form to get a rhythm going. And that rhythm is almost like uh, a, a independent energy that, that leads them along. And they collaborate to maintain that independent rhythm uh, throughout the course of their debate, however long it goes, 10, 15 minutes. And the success of the debate is largely measured not by who wins or who loses, or even what they decide, but whether they maintain that rhythm to the very end. It's beautiful stuff. Uh, and I, I have an article on that in the forthcoming issue of Ethnographia in Czechoslovakia in, in Italy, but the article's in English. Uh, anyway, so that's one example of objectivation. Here, here's another taken from my Games with Rules data. So she said, what do we do with the diet? Oh, we're making that up, no? She says, what do we do if the die goes on the floor? Because she sees this hyperactive guy throwing the dice across and it just barely stays on the table, right? And of course, the very next time he, died, he rolled it, it fell on the floor. Um, but she knows very well. She, she was one of the best students I ever had. Uh, and she knows very well that what people do when the dice goes on the floor. If it's a good number, you just move the piece. And if it's a bad number, you go, oh, well, I have to re-roll. <laughs> so she wanted to prevent the, this guy from getting away with such a thing. So she said, what do we do if the light die rolls on the floor? And then the, uh, the, the fellow there uh, says, well, if it's offensive, and then the, the other woman says, re-roll. And then he repeats re-roll. So the account is re-roll, and the confirmation is re-roll. 
But then something interesting happens, and I, I'll play the rest of it. <laughs> house rule of aggravation. What is a house rule? I, 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 I presume that's a fairly widespread yes, kind of thing. <laughs> um, a house rule of, uh, is something that it's not in the rule book. It wouldn't be in Hoyle if you're playing poker. But it's something that you need to decide in advance to avoid arguments. And usually a casino has its own rules about how certain problems that keep cropping up will be adjudicated. And so you arrange these in advance. These are house rules. So in this case, by making their confirmation that they just made up into a house rule, they've taken it out of their hands and objectivated it. Okay, so they're, they're very mindful of, of what they're doing because they're students studying these phenomena. Um, but, but that's a, a second illustration of objectivation. And the third illustration comes from some uh, coffee studies in Italy. Uh, and this takes place at, the, at a very nice specialty cafe in Trento. Okay. Uh, let's, let's look at the transcript, happy out. Uh, the first person tastes the coffee and says, dark chocolate. And then the second person confirms that and says chocolate. And then the, the, the cafe owner who, who designed the blend and wasn't happy with this assessment said very light tasting, like dark chocolate, being, being sarcastic. He was kind of like not liking that opinion. And then the one who confirms it says, no, because I also independently said chocolate. And so you get the, the, the count and the confirmation. And then the cafe owner says positive or neg negative, I'm not sure which that is. And then they say, no, positive, positive. But then they take the account a bit further. Arachide is peanut. Is it always the same way you you pick up that change in tone of, of the guy. Let me show you what's going on. Uh, she says, for me, it recalls peanuts, the taste of peanuts. And then he says, therefore, always an oily sea. So he's providing a larger summary account of you've got uh, you know, a, a chocolate, which is oily. You've got uh, peanut, which is oily. So then he says, therefore, an oily sea as a kind of summary account. And then the, the person says, yes, that's the very flavor here, confirming that. But then you get the move for objectivation when he says, allora, questa olio qui. So then this oil here, and already when, at the word this, you have the objectivation. Of it. It's not just, just, I say it's an oily sea. It's, you're assuming it's already a fact. This oil, this oiliness. Um, and he even takes it further and says, which is typical of the et Estazione Italiana, right? I mean, it's like really, really important stuff, right? Uh, generalizing it, universalizing it, and boom, you have this objectivated truth. So that's a third case of the uh, neglected objectivity of social facts. Let me be clear, these events don't happen because I've developed a model. And I understand that models can make you blind to what's going on. But used in an apt way, it should lead us to locate, identify, and describe the local work of objectivating the accounts agreed upon. We've studied a lot of accounts, but I want to look at this objectivating activity a little more carefully. And my students have found the, the model helpful. In the studies of accounts, Garfinkel observed that any formulation of local affairs was always subject to review by others. Accounts or formulations are the corporate means by which candidate understandings become public objects. Objectivating an account means to construct a unity for it that can be shared. And whoso persisted in inquiring about objectivation from logical investigations in 1899 to 
his lectures on the origin of geometry in 1936. And in that last one, he said, in the unity of communication among several persons, he's learning from Simmel here, the repeatedly produced structure becomes an object of consciousness, not as a likeness, but as the one structure common to all. For Schutz, this objectivation was the key to tracking inner subjectivity. And he said that it involves the public work by which something is given equally to all. According to Schutz, this intersubjective thought object is formulated by and for the parties. And this was an early clue for Garfield. For Schutz, the objective meaning was the already constituted meaning context of the thing produced whose actual production we meanwhile disregard. This disregard is the social amnesia or the disengagement. One of Garfinkel's extraordinary discoveries was that parties are not motivated by the meaning of an account as much as they are motivated by the demand that they organize their local affairs. One way that people learn what they mean is to objectivate their notion and then observe what it comes to mean. It's like Nancy Pelosi said when she was a speaker of the US House, we have to pass the Obamacare in order to find out what it means. Once an understanding is discovered, as something begins to be played out in local affairs, that understanding can be displayed to everyone present. And then that understanding can be made objective too. That comes later. So there are two steps to the association here, discovery and objectivation. In the words of Husserl, which were adopted and extended by Garfinkel, parties gradually work to substitute objective expressions for essentially subjective and occasional expressions. Husserl did not investigate the local contingencies of this substitution, and Garfinkel took that up as one of the principal topics for ethnomethodological research. In undertaking his studies, Garfinkel and his students discovered something fantastic. This local work includes situations where words, glosses, categories exist as objects for everyone before their practical intelligibility is fixed. In fact, using the glosses in order to fix their sense of reference is part of the work that a local cohort of actors performs when organizing the objective intelligibility of an occasion. The fascinating part of this, and the part that is irrational about it, and here I don't mean non-rational, is because that's what rationality mostly is, is that agreements can occur before people understand just what they mean. But despite the blind into which a cohort is willing to head, the confirmed and objectivated resolution is commonly binding upon everyone from the outset, before its sense and reference has been fully determined. Let me specify with an illustration from some of the coffee tasting research my students at Oregon did. Uh, some st students were filming some tasting by consumers, and one consumer drinks the coffee, I get to sneak in the sip, and says, it's definitely bold. It's definitely bold. It's a very bold coffee, yeah, his friend says. I definitely agree with the boldness. They talk a about a couple of other aspects of the flavor, and then he says, it was really sour, bitter, too strong, but bold. And then the interviewer, one of my students, said, what do you mean by bold? And he says, he was the one that said bold. <laughs> How is bold? Well, of course, B is the one who, who raised the word bold, but A had a hand in it because he had a hand in the confirmation and objectivation of, of the notion. So it wasn't that, uh, that A was completely innocent. Uh, John Heritage and Jeffrey Raymond suggest that, quote, within the general framework of agreement, on a state of affairs, the matter of the terms of agreement can remain. I think they're right about that one. In the midst of agreeing with one another, this is them con con continue, or this is Heritage in, in a 19, 2013 article. In the midst of agreeing with one another, speakers are still addressing the terms of agreement. Really fascinating that. Heritage and Raymond emphasize that there can be a raw affiliation that lacks content and amounts to only a simulacrum of agreement. I'm fascinated with these simulacrums, and I'm searching the world for as many as I can find, and there's tons of them. We're not 
at all speaking about how individual understandings get negotiated. More commonly, no one knows what's going on. And they only serendipitously discover in the emerging affairs some ways to get on the same page. But it's not necessarily even the same page. They only think it's the same page. And the structure can get worked out before the participants themselves have recognized the meaning of what they've worked out. OK, short final word on uh, moral authority. Durkheim's immortal social fact was an orientation he developed in part by considering Montaigne, who spoke of the mystical authority of the law. What is the origin of this mystical authority? Why is there a sense of responsibility for others' expectations? Remember, there are two aspects to accountability. The first is how the emerging affairs can be summarized in an account. And the second is how we're oriented to the expectations of others and so are made accountable to those expectations. The other expects that we would be cooperative, and this expectation can be read on the face of the other. Garfinkel begins his routine, sorry, studies of the routine grounds of everyday activities, which remains the name for our studies even today, by discussing Kant. This is in the first paragraph. For Kant, the moral order within was an awesome mystery. For sociologists, the moral order without is a technical mystery. So we are examining the moral order without. This responsibility that I'm speaking of is anonymous. It's any member's practice. Let's have a very quick look at it. Allora, io ho scritto, vabbè, amaro e non ci ho cercato, però poi ho scritto poco corposo. So she's reporting on what she wrote after tasting the coffee. And she said, well, I've written, it's bitter, it's it got uh, some problem with body. Uh, and then she stops and looks up at the person organizing the meeting, uh, Damiano, a really wonderful uh, young sociologist. Uh, and, and she then asks, do I also have to tell the numbers? Do I have to tell the numbers? She's not sure what she has to do. She's perfectly willing to do what she has to do. She just doesn't know what that is yet. So he doesn't really care. But uh, she's sort of trying to find what the structure is. And so watch how this is done. Do you also want the numbers? Look at, look at this. At this. So he, he's going, well, you know, it's like, after you, Alphonse, after you, Alphonse, you know. Uh, if, uh, well, it's, if, it's, if it's not up to me, but if that's what you want it to be up to me, then it's whatever you want it to be, right? I mean, there's a lot of this going on in the world. I mean, just just look at the uh, at, at the Damiano's uh, gesture here. So they find their way to a structure, to a, a local structure, but it really isn't the case that anybody really proposed it. it they just sort of, what is taking place is that each party is attempting to invent or locate some structure and they stumble their way into any structure. The important thing about this responsibility to do the right thing is that it operates in the midst of these objectivation practices. And we're preoccupied with figuring out what must be done next before the time to do it arrives. So my argument today is that this is part of what comprises the sociality and the reciprocal stimulations that Simmel celebrated. Simmel wrote, perhaps this sort of insight will do for social science what the beginnings of microscopy did for the science of organic life. I certainly hope so. And indeed, the fine grain turn-by-turn analyses of ethnomethodology involve just this kind of microscopy. As Harold was fond of saying, and these were the best words one could ever hope to receive from him, so we have plenty to talk about. Thank you.
that I think is part of what Durkheim is intending by the idea of the immortal social fact. I mean, if people know they produced it, then, and here I'm talking production, uh, but they actually produce it in a, in a very strange way, like I'm describing. Uh, and I'm more interested in how they produce that than I am in social amnesia, which is why I didn't emphasize it. But, uh, but at some point, they, they do forget. Or they pretend to forget, at least. I'm well, not that's sure. What? That's a big difference. It's a big difference. It's hard to tell that difference on the on film. But here you are talking about yourself as a fifth grader having insight into this production. Yeah. Right? As a production. Yeah, all, all this is about getting back to this white brain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I think there is a, a temporality to it. I think it begins with a candidate account, and that account has to be confirmed. And then there's a moment, and th this is the, 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 the cutting edge of my inquiry. What is it that people do after they've confirmed the account to get that account, to get the status of that account raised for the purposes of their organizing the organist? It's they're doing something that's not part of building an account. It's it's kind of has a different uh, agenda to it, but it's it's part of the local orderliness. Uh, so I, I want I want us to, we spent decades looking at accounts. I, I want to spend more time looking at how these declarations occur because they kind of develop accidentally and without this voluntarism, which is I think partly why I'm interested in looking at. The social amnesia part is is uh, you know. You can just use the word disengagement. Something's going on there, and we can talk about that later. But the objectivation one, uh, I'm holding firm on. And it, it's got a pretty good pedigree. I mean, look at Husserl, Schutz, and Garfinkel. Just know. one yeah. final thing that. I mean, you had a form that they were using in the presentation, yeah. right? Yeah. Maybe showing us the form, showing how it's used, and what's transported mm -hmm. via it elsewhere. Be That's a good suggestion. Yeah. Of course, there's dozens of forms. And it, not very really objectified, but it's at least it's. Uh, you can see the work. It's a communicated form that's that's uh, interesting. For Great us suggestion. Follow, uh, yeah. Out of there. Yeah. That's, we'll, we'll definitely have to do that. Um, and it's important. The commentators just say it's not important to have a a particular form. It's not even important to have a good form, but it is important to have a form. And, and that's really interesting to explore. Yes. Is it is it Lucia or yeah, Lucia? It's, it's Lucia. Lucia. Yes. Oh, well, I uh, really enjoyed the paper. Uh, so inspired me a lot. And I I just don't know why you don't use Schuch's more because it seems to me that what you're talking about is all very Schuch's. You know this idea whereby people are constructing some sort of sense of the situation reminds me of what Schutz calls an agreeing or an agreement for all practical purposes. You know, they collaborate together and for mm -hmm. their practices at mm -hmm. hand, they are coming to some kind of agreement. And the next step that you're talking about, the step of our objectivation, reminds me very much of Berger and Luckman when they say people find ways of doing things together and then that becomes like a rule for the next first time, you know, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So I I found it all very inspiring and I can see what you're saying about Garfinkel, but I think that to a certain extent the way you're looking at it is much more Schutzian than ethnomethodological in a way, or at least it's early ethnomethodological. <laughs> And, uh, I, I, I think m maybe Mike and Doug feel that way. <laughs> but, but, but I wanted to test that. Actually, uh, Dan Zahavi here in, in Copenhagen, uh, he also wants me to use Schutz more. He says, Schutz says a lot of things that like no, I think so too. And, I, and, and I'm sure he probably does, but he doesn't have a radical vision of how these phenomena emerge. I cut my teeth on Schutz, and Peter Berger was the first sociologist I studied with. So I'm not at all opposed to them. But uh, it's a very rational worded version of things that we now have much more subtle and, and complicated understandings of how they operate. And I think it's time 
that we pay our respects and move on. Well, talking about the microscopic is not ethnomethodological, but doing it, which I tried to do yeah, some yeah, of, is yes, it? Yes, with your examples and everything. And last thing, uh, the work with the coffee taste, when they were actually trying to tick the boxes and put an amber on it, it just reminded me, me of what I think I think it would probably call a coding practice. Is it not a coding practice? kind of more like quantitative sociologists do when they're trying to put an amber you find it the mean, you find the meaning of the code at the end, not yes, at the beginning. And at the end yeah. you got like, like a frame to understand what was going on. It's not necessarily the same frame but the actual yeah. I mean they, they, they'll say, Oh, I, I I find some cherry in this. And so you dive in with the cherry on your mind and whatever you find turns out to be what cherry is, right? And then there's a the problem of coordinating is my cherry, your cherry. And sometimes you really get into trouble. I was working in, with these brilliant third generation uh, coffee people in Santos, Brazil, who was finding a defect and I couldn't taste it. And he was trying to teach me the defect, so he went and made some coffee that was just full of that defect and I could taste it finally. <laughs> but, but I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's very subtle stuff. Yes. <coughs> I'll try and make this question. So I think it was quite interesting the notion of its, of its objectivation or agreement and whether that means it's a different type of thing, you know, objectivation is maybe elevating it in certain ways. Mm -hmm. and, and the second point I'd like you to reply to was in a way you were stressing the sort of happenstance of everything and nobody having control. I'm not sure if you were saying that in the I development was. of something, but then you could see in your examples certain people were making moves to close it to an agreement in a particular way, like the, the, the girl with the dice preempting the fact that, which you said, and in the coffee tasting, the guy who was the proprietor, I think, sort of kind of going, oh, I'm not happy, oh, I, yes, I can take that and then push us to agree on the sort of oily taste. Yeah. So I mean, people are really intervening. And there's another but, thing... But they do doing. that only one next at a time. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. Yeah. yeah. It's not long people have different it. kind of stakes in it, and then there's a question about what's at stake in the whole thing. What are you constructing, or where are you going to with a, a objectivation? Because maybe in... Um, uh, institutional settings, people are a bit more deliberate about where they want things to go in setting up the process. Does that make sense yeah, as yeah. a modification? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think, uh, I think, I'm not saying there's no uh, intentionality at all. To do, we have to collect a different uh, bag of data to do this study. But I think you'd find enough absolutism that to, uh, to 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 maybe support the degree to which I think they disengage from their participation. <coughs> it's not that people can't revisit. Uh, Priest has this great line toward the end of Remembrance of Things Past that that every war is fought on new terms. It's, it's 
he says it's like good old Hegel's law, you know, that, that everything happens new. Uh, and, and generals are always fighting the last battle, the last war, uh, and therefore not succeeding. I mean, everything starts anew, so you can take whatever's there and change it. I'm not saying that you don't do that. But there is, is some uh, self-denial, I guess, uh, and maybe genuine self-forgetting of the hand that one played in it, partly because it wasn't as deliberative as the uh, rational choice theorists would, would provide it at the outset, it kind of happened accidentally, like the case of the uh, coffee uh, person who said it was bold, oh, it was the other guy who did it. I, I didn't do it, but he did do it. I mean, it's, if nobody maybe owns it in the individualist way, uh, tell me more. Anyway, thanks a lot. <laughs>